in tough times. We at the Department of English even started a program called Your Teachers for You, where we took turns to send out positive messages on a daily basis through voicemail and videos to our students. We read assuring poems to them. We are now doing the same thing once a week. We, knowing that our students are happy to see us online and hear our voices, reinforce the power of literature to connect people. I thank my colleagues at the Department of English, Queen Mary's College, for the comradeship we share this time, and I extend a warm welcome to them. Belonging to an ancient institution like Queen Mary's College also plays a part in strengthening one's sense of self. These feelings received a boost, especially after we celebrated our centenary in 2014. Queen Mary's College is now 106 and going strong. Queen Marians have always responded to challenging times and changes in their world. The Platinum and Diamond Jubilee souvenirs have personal accounts from our alumna on the war years and the climate on campus when Winston Churchill, Britain's war prime minister, charged British loyalties with his rhetoric and also the students' participation in the Quit India movement and their support to the India-China War of 1962 and 1967. I would like to read a few simple and touching lines, an allusion to the Indochina War, from an account by Mrs. Bhuvaneswari, an alumna of our college. She writes, the next year I was chosen as vice president of the college union. We had a grand midnight party on the seashore. There was a beautiful full moon that night. Mrs. Airavati, the principal, garlanded us and we had dinner by the sea. Being the vice president of the college union, I had the opportunity to go to Satyamurti Bhavan to invite our chief minister, Mr. Kamraj, to attend the function. He obliged willingly. It was during that time that the Indo-China war was going on. Mr. Kamraj shared with us the needs of the soldiers. And while addressing the students from Tashkent Terrace, he requested us to donate liberally for the war and raise support for the Jawans. His speech was short and sincere. His words were like Pidibar. magic. Start, start video, Pidibar. His words worked like magic and immediately His words worked like magic and immediately many students removed the gold jewelry that they wore on their necks and hands and placed it on the table before Mr. Kamraj. All of us donated cash as well. It was such a memorable experience. Many girls knitted woolen shawls and sweaters for the Jawans and sent them to the war front. We marched on Marina Beach behind Chief Minister Kamraj for nearly two kilometers, singing patriotic songs like Janda Uncha Rahe Hamara. That is the spirit that lives amongst us in Queen Mary's College even today. Coming to the deliberations for these four days, there are four themes, disease and death, displacement of human communities, transcendence, and existentialism, which we will over, uh, explore under the overarching theme of literature in times like these. Perhaps these times witness a peak in terms of the existentialist angst. Dr. Samuel Rufus, Associate Professor of English at Madras Christian College, has been kind and gracious in accommodating us in his busy schedule on the webinar circuit. Dr. Rufus needs no introduction, but an introduction might be required 
for those who are listening to him for the first time. Dr. Samuel Rufus began his career in American College Madurai and later joined the Madras Christian College in 2003. He has a star-spangled profile, spanning his days as a student and his career as an associate professor of English. As a student, he was the recipient of the President Venkatraman Gold Medal for Academic Excellence, and he received this medal from His Excellency, then Governor of Tamil Nadu, Shri P.S. Ram Mohan Rao. He has authored four books, edited seven, and edited three journals. He has published 20 papers in books and journals. He specializes in post-colonial studies, cultural studies, Literary, literary theory, criticism, and bioregional literature. I welcome you, Dr. Rufus, to this lecture series. You are flagging off the first of our lectures. And thank you so much, sir, for joining us today and obliging us in the midst of your busy schedule. So before I hand over to Professor Rufus, an announcement. So participants who need e-certificates Kindly type out your full name, designation, and the name of your institution in the chat box on Zoom, if you're on Zoom, or, or in the comment section of YouTube, if you're viewing on YouTube. So um, with this, I will hand it over to Dr. Rufus. Please, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Maria Preeti Srinivasan. It's indeed a pleasure, a joy, and a great privilege to be associated with a pioneering initiative uh, organized by the Department of English, Queen Mary's College, Chennai. I'm privileged uh, to be here. I hope you know, all of us are privileged you know, to be associated with Queen Mary's College because you know, the lecture series that you have given us, the topic that you've given us is so meaningful for these times. So literature in times like these. So I thank the Department of English, the principal, and all the faculty members for having invited me over here. I'll begin uh, in right earnest. But before that, I hope you know, some of the students or research scholars, uh, you might uh, want to have a pen and a paper ready with you in case you come across some new concepts or things at hand. So I'm told that there are more than 2,300 uh, registrations. And for the first time, I'm also told that another section uh, exclusively for uh, you know, um, social workers, paramedical staff, uh, medical fraternity, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors has been accommodated in this wonderful seminar. And uh, all uh, thanks to Dr. Maria Preeti Srinivasan and the team. Uh, so, this topic on existentialism that I intend to discuss uh, this morning will be very broad in its ambit, very broad in its scope, not necessarily touching upon the intricate nuances of the theoretical base of existentialism, but rather it should go on the basis or an overview to what exactly do we mean by existentialism and how it applies to our everyday aspect of life in these troubled, troubling times. So I will go back to the 19th century to trace three concepts that were of much use or problematized in the 19th century. Three concepts that were literally problematized in the 19th century. And the first one is the problem or the concept of the real. The real was problematized in the 19th century for many reasons. Right. What was the real and what was a culturally induced illusion? A host of theoreticians started pondering about the idea of what exactly do we mean by the real? And the second concept that merited a lot of attention and discussion and deliberations in the 19th century would be the concept of identity. Who am I? What am I doing? How do I exist? How do I know that I exist? Because it was an age of crisis. And so, you know, this identity crisis was debated, discussed and deliberated by a host of scholars, philosophers, pragmaticians, 
and uh, uh, poets also. The third one is the concept of time that was rigorously problematized in the 19th century. Now for this lecture or for this talk, I would like to invoke on this concept of time, how it was problematized in the 19th century and what is its relevance to existentialism and to us. Because I uh, believe we are a, 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 an audience that is very inclusive, not necessarily professors, not necessarily uh, you know, students or research scholars, but it's a comprehensive uh, uh, group. So I would like to be very comprehensive, not necessarily going to the nuances of the, you know, the literary part of it, but how we can relate. Because these are troubling times that we live in, testing times. So how it relates the concepts that we discussed with the, the pivotal point of discussion that is time. So uh, how it relates to our everyday lives also. I will take you to an 1859 incident or rather three incidents that happened in the year 1859, very important for our deliberations. One is the publication of Charles Dickens's wonderful book, A Tale of Two Cities. We all know the background to The Tale of Two Cities is the French Revolution and how you know, Charles Dickens was always vouching for an authentic mode of life in, through his novels, through his works. Right? Most of his novels, you have this discussion or these deliberations on uh, you know, an authentic mode of life. So one of the first novelists who was propagating an authentic mode of existence out from the inauthentic mode of existence that was in work in the 19th century, because it was the age of in the tale of two cities, the opening sentence tells us that, right? It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. So it was the age where we had everything, it was the age where we had nothing before us. So these were the times, very testing times for them. Why? Because the first reason is there was a disappearance of the invocacy of God or belief in God. And the second was the industrial revolution had done a lot towards contributing to this crisis in society. Everyone was driven by the concept of money. Time became very important all of a sudden. The next uh, you know, uh, book that he has written, you know, most of the books that he has, you know, novels that he has written, Hard Times or Great Expectations, Bleak House, portrays how society has been you know, ridden with these problematics and how one can come out of it to live an authentic mode of existence. The, con the concept of authenticity that we'll be discussing with regard to existentialism. We also find um, the next person, Charles Darwin, 24th November, 1859. We all know that magnum opus that he gave us on the origin of species, where again, time occupies a pivotal place. That's because he says species or organisms evolve over a period of time. This time concept was occupying the minds, not only of naturalists like Darwin, not only novelists like Dickens, but also philosophers in the 19th century for the first time. Of course, you know, right through the ages, right from Aristotle, you know, the concept of time has been dealt with, but the crisis was that in the Victorian sensibility or the Victorian consciousness was occupied basically with this central theme or the concept of time. And the third one, right, a very important one in 1859, Big Ben. We all know Big Ben means the big clock that is at the northern side of the Westminster, right, palace, in the palace there, towards the northern side you have it. In 1859, it was installed. And why Big Ben? It's supposed to be uh, one of the clocks that gives the most accurate time for us. And why Big Ben? Because time matters. Everything 
in Victorian society focused or was driven by this concept of time. You have minarets, you have cathedrals, you have railway stations, you have bus stations. Everywhere you will, they'll will sport a huge clock. And why was that? For the first time, they realized that time was necessarily commodified. And the importance of time. We know what it means to commodify a particular thing. And this happened in 1859, a very important, uh, you know, that's why uh, Friedrich Engels, when he was discussing the problems of the working class of, uh, you know, England in his uh, 1845 book, right? When he was discussing the problems of the working class, he says, you know, time and money were running concurrently that for the people in the working class England, pain was not something bodily, but pain or suffering was when somebody incurred a financial loss. Pain or suffering was when someone underwent a huge loss on the financial sector. So the pain, the concept of pain has shifted uh, in a place and now the concept of money and time begin to occupy a very important space or place in Victorian sensibilities. Next year, 1846 in the German ideology, Friedrich Engels and Karl Marx have stressed again on the importance of time, historical time, how the, you know, the ideas of the ruling class they have occupied the universal space in our minds over a period of time. You now he traces, you know, the materialistic conception of history. How time, the historical conception of time. This was, you know, in 1846. And then you have uh, the gay science. It's a wonderful book. The gay here means doesn't have anything to do with the, the sexual part of it. The gender roles here. The gay in previous days, it meant joy. The translation was the joy of wisdom, the gay science. Here, you know, in 1882, Friedrich Nietzsche, when he wrote this, you know, in this wonderful book, he talks about the doctrine of eternal recurrence. The doctrine of eternal recurrence. Eternal recurrence means time recurs over a period of time again and again. And what does it do? It haunts you. It literally haunts you, jolts you out of your stupor. What is this eternal recurrence? He gives an example. You know, this book has a lot of, you know, it's poetic, a collection of aphorisms. Um, it's aphorism 341, if I'm right, where he says, what if? You know, he gives us a very, you now this sentence has been reverberating in the minds of literary scholars all over the world. You now, Nisha, for all that he has said and done, you know, some of his concepts have universal value. Although he was attacking Christianity vehemently all through his life. He said, what if suddenly in your loneliest of loneliness, I repeat, what if all of a sudden or suddenly in your loneliest of loneliness, a demon comes up to you and tells you in your loneliest of loneliness, a demon comes up to you and tells you, hey, look at this. The past that you have lived, the present that you are living, the future that you're going to be living is going to be the same. There is not going to be any change whatsoever in the way you're going to deal with the past, the present. Everything is going to occur again and again and again. That means eternal recurrence. It's going to be the same every day. There is a movie that I love a lot. It's called uh, The Groundhog Day, where the lead character, the guy, he you know, witnesses the same day again and again and again. Over a, it's, it's like being caught in a time loop. And that's what he says. What if you happen to see the same sun every day, rising every day, the same moon, rising up every night to greet you. The same things happen every morning. You do this, every afternoon you do this, 
Every evening you come back from work and night you sleep. The next day, every morning you go to work, have your bath, freshen up, go to work, then come back, uh, you know, be in your home, relax in the evening, then night, you get back to sleep. Next morning, you get back to work, the same thing recurs. What will you do in this predicament? This is a predicament. What will you do in such a predicament? When you feel that this eternal recurrence is there to haunt you. The next line he has, you know, won't you gnash your teeth and roll on the ground and shout, no, this is not what I wanted. The same thing is going to happen over and over again in my life. I don't want it. Or there are two things he says can happen. One is you can be shocked and you can be paralyzed for life thinking about this haunting thing. Just imagine every day, you know, you morning you go by train, evening you come back by train. Morning you go by train, evening you come. This eternal recurrence. In time, caught in a time loop. And he was giving us in the next, very next year, 1883, he gave us a very phenomenal philosophy philosophical novel we all know that thus spoke Zoratastra. began in 1883 finished in 1885 it's a phenomenal work that uh, Nietzsche has given us in which he talks about the concept of the overman or the ubermanch that he discusses in the gay signs also he says you know here he, again he attacks you know Christianity he says a slave morality that Christianity tells you why is it a slave morality because it teaches you that you are slaves, literally, metaphorically. The priest in, in the church, you know, asks you to stand up, you all stand up like a herd. He asks you to kneel down, every one of us kneels down. He asks you to clap your hands, every one of us claps our hands. A slave morality, he uses a word, a very uh, 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 disastrous word, could be, but I'm just quoting Nisha, echoing Nisha. He says, they are poison mixers who always talk of the afterlife. They always talk about, if you have a crisis today, they will say, don't worry, in the eternal life, you'll get double fold. If you have a problem today, they will tell you, don't worry, it's natural. In the next life or the life after, you'll get double fold or tenfold or hundredfold. This mentality or this morality, you know, he calls them poison mixers. He says, you should step out of this morality, this slave morality. Why? To become the overman. Of course, there are, you know, positive and negative connotations to whatever he has said. Adolf Hitler was heavily influenced by Nietzsche. We all know it. But the essence of this topic is, right? Once we realize that we have the power within us. We will never be dictated upon by any power in society. You feel you are an ubermanch or a superman or an overman. Superior being, the will to power that he talks about. Next comes in the year 1895. Uh, we all know H.G. Wells, one of the first you know, to write uh, about uh, time traveling. H.G. Wells gave us the time machine where he uses actually the time machine as a launch pad to critique the basic you know, um, prejudices that are there in society. The Morlocks and uh, the Eloi, right? the groundlings. The Morlocks means those who live, you know, uh, one section they live underground. They are not even able to see light. The other section, you know. Uh, so this was in the 19th century, 1895 you have H.G. Wells giving us uh, the time machine, again, the concept of time. So chronological time, historical conception of time, you have here this meditation on time traveling and fast forward to the 20th century. In the year uh, 1921, a very important scientist got his Nobel Prize, we all know. Right, uh, Albert Einstein. Why do I have to invoke Albert Einstein? He is the realm of the physicist. Why should I invoke Albert Einstein? He has a lot to do with the concept at hand. He got his Nobel not for his theory of relativity, for his you know uh, for his findings of the photoelectric effect, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
yes, he came out with again, right? Another conception of time, but another philosopher who, you know, who debated with him, right? On 6th April, 1922, another great philosopher, most of us know him, some of us might not, Henry Bergson, B-E-R-G-S-O-N, the Bergsonian conception of time, very important for literary minds like you and me. Why is that? For the first time, there was a great debate between the greatest philosopher or one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century and one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century, Einstein, and you have Bergson. This was in the year 1922 in Paris. You know, it was a kind of a dialogue where one tried to outsmart the other, outwit the other in their uh, discussions, in their concepts. But many were very convinced about the concept of time that Bergson gave us. You can log into YouTube sometime later to have a, a, a for, a, you know, a, an insight into what uh, this debate was all about. The debate has been you know, widely discussed on social media also because many were not convinced, maybe scientists were convinced, but Bergson's ideas convinced a huge majority, especially literary minds or literary souls. And what was this conception of time? He talks about dury or internal time consciousness. And what is that? The time that we have in our memories, in our meditations, in our reflections, in our dreams, in our anticipations. The concept of time that we invoke when we think about something. Kamala Das, in her, you know, when she reflects on my grandmother's house, one of her best poems, she says, you know, when she finds the present very difficult to endure or to bear, what does she do? She escapes. You know? Escapism is a very predominant theme in literature. We all know that. When people don't know how to face the present, what they do is they tend to escape into another world. My grandmother's house was a beautiful paradise of escape for Kamala Das. For kids, the world of escape was the world of the nightingale. Oh, nightingale, he says. And then towards the end, he says, forlorn that very word calls me back to my real self. Whether it's fled that visionary gleam, do I wake or sleep? The moment he hears the word forlorn, he comes back. It's a rude jolt. Escapism. Uh, another, you know, wonderful uh, story. It's, a, it's actually a movie, The Truman Show, where again you have this concept of, you know, uh, time. You know, the concept of time has been, you know, related in this existential movie. It is a must to watch for every one of us not only you know, practitioners of literature, for every one of us. The lead character there, he, you know, he doesn't know that he is caught up in a time loop. He's in an island, most of us would have known that movie, but please, for heaven's sake, watch that movie at least once over. He's, he is in, a, in an island, which is a setup, which is a setup. And in this island, he finds that the whole crew in that island they're all living human beings and they're all doing their own work, but everyone's attention is focused on him because he is being live cast on television, like the, you know, what's that, the, the show that we have on, uh, you know, Big Boss, you know, reality shows, you know. Every aspect of his life, 24 7, was broadcast or live casted on television all over the world. And everyone ditched all their you know, work that they had and they were glued to the television set, what is he going to do when he gets to meet a girl? You know, when he goes to college or when he goes to, you know, his workplace. Right from his childhood, every aspect of his life, now he feels, after a period of time, he feels this monotonous drudge of his life. One day he suspects the whole thing. What's happening to me? When he feels everyone around him is imitating the same thing again and again. Every morning, someone says, good morning, afternoon, good, you know, good afternoon, good evening. 
he finds something is wrong. This daily recurrence, eternal recurrence. Now he starts to think. Now he starts to question, what's happening to me? Why is everyone looking at me? And towards the end, we know how it ends, no spoilers for us. But finally, you know, uh, after he goes through that crisis moment, how does he embrace liberation? This was, right, uh, uh, the, the theme of this wonderful movie, The Truman Show. Please, I think you should watch it. It will give you real meaning to life. Another movie, right, uh, would be uh, Into the Wild, where a, a boy, you know, renounces everything that he has and goes into the wild and he lives his life there. The Bergsonian concept of time proved very influential for all of philosophy from then on, from then on. This was, right, uh, this was very important for him because in 1927, he got the Nobel Prize for literature. Yes, he got the Nobel Prize, Bergson, Henry Bergson. And that same year, another important thing happened in 1927, that was Martin Heidegger gave us a very important book. It's called Being and Time. I repeat, Being and Time. Henry Bergson got his Nobel for his uh, ruminations on time. Here, Martin Heidegger writes a book called Being and Time, a book that is supposed to be one of the benchmarks or hallmarks for an evaluation of time from the 20th century till today. Even today we know Heidegger occupies great respect all over the globe because of his conception of time. I told you in the 19th century, there were three concepts that were problematized. One is the problem of the real, the problem of uh, identity and the problem of time. I told you I'll be discussing on the concept of time and the importance of time through the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. And now we have come to the real book, 1927. Yeah, of course, a whole lot of other things also happened in the year 1927. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, right? Again, right? a whole lot of things bordering on time happened in that particular year. But this book occupies a lot of significance because for the first time there was a philosopher who was out there destroying philosophy. Like uh, dynamite was supposed to be an invention to end all inventions or deconstruction of the theory that distracted or not distracted or reconstructed or that demolished all hitherto existing conceptions. Similarly, this great philosopher, he came out with a new conception in his philosophical views. Of course, he was heavily indebted to Husserl, his guru, for this, right, Heidegger. And what is this book all about, being and time? Being means you and I exist in time. That's why we are called beings human beings. That means you and I exist, existing, continue to exist. Present continuous. That's why we're called beings. And what are we, you know, in this concept of being? We are conditioned by our finitude, finitude. Or we are conditioned by our mortality. We are conditioned by time, like, you know, the time's winged chariot that Andrew Marvel talks about in his two is my mistress. We are conditioned by time. That is why they say, you no, know, clocks run. They don't say clocks walk. They don't say clocks, you know, uh, amble up. They say clocks run. One reason why you know, uh, time occupies a very important role in 20th century. The American conception of time. Of course, you know, time differs from culture to culture. That's a different concept. You know, every, uh, every nation or every region has their own conceptions of time. 
the materialistic american or the western conception of time tells us that you know you are respected based on the amount of money that you make over a period of time say for example you have 25 years of uh you know work ahead of you 25 years that you can work and at the end of 25 years you want to save or have 1 crore rupees in your pocket at the end of 25 years that means every year you will have to right approximately 4 lakh rupees you will have to earn that means every year 4 lakh rupees and every month say for example 250 days you work per year every month approximately 33300 rupees every month you have to save not earn that means every day around 3300 rupees approximately every hour you save 50 rupees approximately so one hour wasted for me 50 rupees wasted in my savings not earnings so after 25 years i get to have an accumulated sum of 1 crore rupees this conception of time that is commodified the commodification of time in correlation with the money aspect now in 1937 when heidegger was telling us we are beings having a limited period of time and within this period of time we have to live there are two ways he says to live in this limited period of time i am invoking a very broad audience when i say this although there are many concepts there one predominant concept that he discusses in this wonderful book is the concept of authenticity what kierkegaard would say existential authenticity what is this authenticity an authentic life when i think or when i realize that i am a being just imagine i am called a being you are called a being we are called human beings because we exist in time aristotle was one of the pioneering philosophers who gave us this definition of time we all know he has written various treatises on physics on poetics on politics but in his treatise on physics he says he defines time i already you know repeated this he defines time what is time he says you know one concept that eludes definition isn't it what is time immediately we'll say you know the time is 10 10 what is time that's what you'll say so when we go into a philosophical rumination of time he says you can't define time but for practical purposes he says from a philosophical view point he says time is the now einstein was very much catapulted by this conception of time the nowness of time what walter benjamin would call the aura this it's placing in a particular period of time a pen has its point in time that's why we you know uh, we say you know the social milieu that hippolytain would tell us it has its aura or its being in time and that's what you know makes it unique in time now coming back heidegger when he was giving us this concept of being in time he says there are two modes of existence one is called the authentic mode of existence the second is the inauthentic mode of existence what is the authentic mode of existence when i am aware of my finitude my finitude finitude means my finiteness that i am a being today but when i am dead i become a dead body no one is going to respect me as a being any longer you know these times of crisis even you know a uh, great people uh you know um who when they pass away be it doctors others are afraid of them they to go near them because you know the corona virus should not come near them they become a body after they are dead they are not beings any longer 
And this is a fundamental premise that pervades the consciousness of Heidegger. An authentic mode of existence, an inauthentic mode of existence. An authentic mode of existence tells us or conditions our lives to the concept that time for us is very limited. After your exam, maybe one hour or two hours or 40 minutes, what does the invigilator say? Your time is up. That means your time is over. Finitude, the little time that we have, you know, when we realize that we have only a little time in this world, we rise up to the occasion and how we deter from all kinds of idle talk. This is the word that he uses again and again, Heidegger. He says, I detest or I hate idle talk, gossip, vain talk, talking about others all the time. Heidegger says this. That is why, you know, Heidegger is a rage, it's a craze all over. And the next mode he says, in authentic existence, when you try to fit in into predefined roles in society. What are these predefined roles? Predefined roles in the sense, you know, once, you know, you are the, the first three years of our lives, you know, that's what philosophers say, you know, the first three years of our lives, when we are totally, right, when we are totally free, after three years, the little child gets a lot of attention, lot of cuddling, right? and a lot of love. Three years over for the child. The very next day, a huge bag on the back. And then she has to cry, looking at her mom and say, Mom, I don't want to go. Please, I don't want to go. Why? Because, you know, it has celebrated or enjoyed this beautiful freedom at home. Now she's going to go to school where she's going to be conditioned into another mode of existence where this child looks from the class out at her mother and says, Ma, I want to come with you. Please take me with you. But mom says, no. You have a predefined role. What? You'll have to sit in class after your you know, third year. You will have to go to your kindergarten and then upper kindergarten, and then first year, second year, 10th, then you, th these are predefined roles, rubrics that have been governing our lives. And the next question is, how much marks did you score? You are evaluated most stupidly on the marks that you score. If a child makes spelling mistakes, that is it. How careless you make spelling mistakes. As if making spelling mistakes is a great crisis that is going to affect. Predefined roles in society that torment us. Predefined conceptions, biases, prejudices that condition the child into her mode of existence is called inauthentic mode of existence. When I am defined or when I'm very conscious of what others think of me, my color, my physique, why am I so lean? Why am I so fat? Why am I so tall? Why am I so... Conformity. Conformity begets what is called stereotypes. When we look back at these conformities, it tends to suppress the real person I knew, the real, the real person in you. These conformities bog you down, he says. This is an inauthentic mode of existence. The, the pleasant, the good, and the, the, uh, the, you know, the meaningful. This is what philosophers divided. The pleasant, the good, and the meaningful. The pleasant is a life of luxury. You know. Everything you have, you enjoy. Eat while you eat. Sleep while you sleep. Laugh and be merry. You go. The good and the meaningful life are different because, like Thoreau says, we have come into this world not to be happy, but to be useful. An authentic mode of existence. An inauthentic mode of existence makes you subscribe to some of the ideals enshrined in society by maybe the capitalist, the ruling class, or those in power over a period of time. 
I have written an article a long time back where, where I say the most stupidest question to ask a person is when are you going to get married? A very dumb question, a very lame question or a very stupid question that anybody could ask a person. When are you going to get married? A person who is really in charge of their lives will never have the guts to ask another person, when are you going to get married? Make someone celebrate their existence. Maybe she had the guts not to be married. She wanted to celebrate her identity all by herself. She feels her identity might be threatened if she gets married or he gets married. So he wants to be a spinster. She wants to be a spinster. She want, he wants to be a bachelor in this life. What's your problem? When are you going to conform these and inauthentic life? If a person doesn't get married, Pavam, I don't know what happened to him. He's not yet married. He's nearing 40. Pavam, this girl, she's nearing 35. She's not yet married. Are you Pavam? Pity her. Conformities. An inauthentic life, says Heidegger. And the next question they'll ask is, are you married? Yes. How many children do you have? They will not be worried about how you are. They will not ask you anything about how you are. The next question they'll ask, how many children do you have? As if that person's identity is based entirely on the, uh, the number of children that she or he begets in authentic modes of existence. How many times we have done this? Please let us remember, existentialism is a theory, right? That liberates. If literature, right, really liberates, its meaning of liberation lies in this essential premise that existentialism tells us. If a person is too tall, the next question we ask them is, Paum, a pity. How will you get a spouse? You're too tall. The next question that the conformed mindset in us will ask him is, or ask her is, it will be difficult for you to, you know, to go by train, especially in the sleeper. You know, you are too tall, no? How do you adjust conformities? When a person tries to be individualistic, the society, as in the Truman Show, tries to bog them down tries to suppress them by their conformities. When a person wants to come out of a stifled marriage or a, you know, a family life, immediately the society, inauthentic existence, tells them, she doesn't know how to live her life, that's why she came out. What a dumb question. When the whole society should stand up and respect her and salute her for coming out of a stifled marriage and celebrating her life in her own terms, here is a dogmatic, perverted person in society who is telling her or who is accusing her she doesn't know how to live. When in fact, she's really living her life in the way she wills it to be. She wants it to be an authentic mode of existence. Where these stereotypes, these stigmas that occasionally beset us and put us down, conformities. That is why, you know, Kierkegaard says, crowd is untruth. Crowd is untruth because the crowd can be easily deceived. And whatever, you know, like in uh, Julius Caesar, where he says, you know, uh, the, 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 about the impulsive nature of the Roman mob. Crowd is untruth. It takes guts to be individualistic. It takes guts to live an authentic mode of existence. And these conformities, they, what they do, they deter you from being a liberated being in this little time that you have in this planet. Being and time. Sartre was very much influenced by Heidegger. And that's what, you know, in 1943, he wrote Being and Nothingness. Of course, you know, Sartre, uh, Simone de Bois, Camus, they all are pioneering existentialists, although the trend was set by Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and others. Heidegger, right, um, he dabbled in phenomenology, 
is also called an existentialist but his conceptions of time were very important from for philosophy for literature for all pragmatists from then on because he said abstractions or generalizations or totalizations you know totalizations essentialisms are dangerous for society what in post colonial studies also we do know stereotypes based on a totalized template is anathema when i evaluate an individual based on these practices husserl edmund husserl sartre went back to husserl to germany right from france he went to germany to study husserl why because he found that he was the talk of the town and you know what husserl did he told the students think in a different way think without any preconceived notions when you approach something when you approach a topic when you approach a person approach them without any preconceived notions he calls it bracketing or epochy step aside from all your prejudices biases husserl was a lover of coffee so he said give me my cup of coffee he you know in a seminar he used to tell his students give me my cup of coffee i will make phenomenology out of it and what does he mean by that he says you know a cup of coffee for example if i have a cup of coffee in front of me right this is not coffee this is you know this is a tumbler of uh, water but still excuse me a cup of coffee he says that is in my hand right now can you describe it he says can you describe this cup of coffee in my hand that i'm going to drink right now in front of you he tells us students in a seminar in his seminars in his discourses that they call it can you describe this cup of coffee in my hand not coffee in general the anatomy of the coffee seed the botany of the plant the chemistry that went behind the growth of this coffee seed arabica or robusta what made this coffee seed sprout up in a particular clime or place you can do a lot of things like that how it is exported how it is roasted how it is ground how it is water pressed and then how it comes steaming hot in front of you in a beautiful little cup there was a wonderful book in the year 1923 820 pages exactly 820 pages it's called all about coffee written by william ukers u k e r s 820 pages devoted to coffee he was a coffee lover an ardent coffee lover like some of us and in this particular book he talks about how great literary minds in the past were so addicted to coffee so glued to their you know coffee cups now husserl says any amount of these reams and reams of paper that you can do on coffee cannot come anywhere near to the cup of coffee that i have in my hand because this cup of coffee that i have in my hand only i can experience it you can never totalize it you can never essentialize it you can never say the coffee that you have in your hand is not good that is why sartre came up with this wonderful premise that was the catch phrase of existentialism from all, from then on in 1945 when he gave his lecture that memorable lecture which was then you know translated you know made into a book in 1946 existentialism and humanism he was a rage 20 uh, 28 october 1945 when he gave this lecture to students in paris there was a huge crowd waiting to literally thronging him to listen to this five foot guy a very ordinary guy but full of you know such vivacious uh, you know the joy for life he gave this beautiful statement existence precedes essence most of us know this beautiful doctrine that he gave us existence precedes essence what is that that means 
I as an individual don't don't succumb to any predefined notions about me because existence precedes essence. I am not built on a previously you know set up model. Every day I define myself. I grow, and that is the difference between me as a human being. And in those days, you know, although today we call even animals beings, in those days, human beings were differentiated from animals. They were called the creatures, great and small. They were called the creatures because they don't have this conception in them. But, you know, they are also living beings. They also, you know, uh, they also exist along with us. This conception that, you know, uh, the, the essence I don't have an essence in me. I build my essence in me every day. How do I do it in time, over a period of time, when I realize that I am a victim of time and I carry death in me? The vibhuti that we wear, a beautiful example to the mortality. One day, the sacred ash that we wear, that we sport. What a beautiful example that tells us, one day, oh mortal, you will become like this. So today, even as you apply the sacred ash, remember that you got to do something good, meaningful, not pleasure. Right? There are three aspects here. Pleasant, good, and meaningful. Something good, something, something, something meaningful to society. Existence means, right, how I build my life. A tree has an existence. A neem tree has its own bit of sweetness to it. And this is how it grows, we can tell, you know, based on a, 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 a dog or a kitten. A pup will tell how it grows. It has an existence over a period of time. We say, you know, the, the, a, a dog that is brought up in India for maybe five years, it will bark, bow wow. After five years, you take it across the Atlantic to the West, to the US. There also it will bark, bow wow, for many long years, as long as she lives. But a human being brought up in India or born in India, five or 10 years, he will stay, Vanakam, Namaskaram, Namaste. But when he goes across the Atlantic, or he or she will say, Good morning, how are you? How do you do? We are creatures who are conditioned by the geographical positioning in which we are placed. Culture is a great conditioner. He says, you know, in the authentic mode of existence, you know, Sartre says existence precedes essence. That means I, def I don't have a predefined essence in me. Every day, by the things that I do, I build for myself an essence based on my existence. But this is in contrast to, you know, the uh, uh, Cartesian um, famous dictum, no, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. No. Now he says it's the other way around. I think, therefore I am. No. Right? I exist. Existence precedes exit. You know, um, Heidegger gives a beautiful concept called thrown into the world. Thrownness. What is this thrownness all about? Just imagine, one fine day, you realize, you know, as a little being, all alone in an island, you don't know where you are from, what you're doing here, how did you come into this world? Last month, I read in the newspapers, a guy, a couple of months back, a guy, right, uh, took his parents to court because they brought him in without his permission. He says, I didn't want to come into this world. Why did you bring me into this world? You know, it uh, was in the newspapers and there was a lot of commentary on that. Thrownness means I am thrown into this world without any predefined essence in me, but based on how I live my life in the authentic or inauthentic modes, I define my essence. So I'm not already predefined. I am that beautiful phrase that we love a lot. What is that phrase? I am a work in progress. What a beautiful term. 
isn't it like a beautiful term i love a lot work in progress another concept you know some of the concepts that heidegger tells us are you know really good the concept of thrownness or the concept of dwelling he says we are not residents we are dwellers a dweller means i realize that i have a particular existence in this world for a particular brief period of time that's it after that like you know you have the beautiful shakespearean lines all the world is a stage you have your entries and your exit i am conscious not only of my entry into this world that i am thrown into this world i don't have a predefined aura in me but i create it every day although my biology conditions me this is what you know camus says albert camus although you know i may have a restricted freedom but still i have my freedom although my biology conditions me although my geography conditions me although my color conditions me although my race conditions me my nationality conditions me my community or other considerations condition me they step aside when i define myself they cannot define myself <clears throat> they cannot define my identity for me because i am a work in progress every day i make myself all the way by the things that i do in other words heidegger says the choices that i make i can conform to societal dictates and that is why you find most of the journeys that you find in these existential novels or existential stories these journeys journeys are a huge slap on the face of conformity you will find these journeys you know that the lead character the hero he or she undertakes this journey is not necessarily a journey to realize themselves to understand their being the, the who they are but necessarily a protest against conformity in life what does conformity do to you it doesn't make you realize that you are a liberated being it tells you that you are a slave to everything that happens around you can't rise up conformity begets what is called sigmund freud says it you know in studies in hysteria that he wrote to this you know joseph brewer conformity he says results in what is called anxiety the society tells you don't do it the super ego the societal principle tells you don't do it the id says do it nike you know just do it the id says do it society says the super ego says don't do it the ego sits at the center in the middle of these two powerful forces the pleasure principle says just do it the id says do it the super ego says don't do it the ego tries to balance the id and the super ego at one particular point of time when it cannot balance it what happens it it results in anxiety extremes of fear so when does anxiety come when does depression come in times like these i'm just trying to relate everything of what we discussed in times like these how does anxiety come when we feel the society i live in i i should conform to the norms of the society i should marry if i am 30 years old before 30 i should be married if not they get into swings mood swings anxiety by 50 or by 40 or you know i i should bear children conformity by 30 or 35 i should get a job otherwise i will not get a good spouse conformity i should save money for myself that is why heidegger says you no know, when you dwell you will not be conscious of all these things around you you will feel you are a part of this interconnected existence where like the birds you live for the moment an authentic life these journeys existential journeys that are undertaken 
these are all not only you know uh, journeys to find themselves like Paulo Coelho's alchemist or many other journeys that you find in literature into the wild was basically from a book where a real guy you know he was given a scholarship for 25 thousand dollars he put that in a check gave it to you know um, uh, people the needy who deserved it he wrote there your need is more than mine he wrote it posted the check and went into the wild why he says conformity kills me the moment he graduated from college that's how the the, the, the movie starts the book starts in a different tangent when he graduates from college, the next thing that his parents do is, right, they celebrate his graduation, you know, like taking selfies, a whole lot of things that we do. When we, you know, celebrate these events in life, we are succumbing to the temptations of conforming, he says. They say, we'll buy you a car. We'll have to go for higher education here. And then you'll have to find a girl for yourself. Then you'll have to settle in and you'll have to give us a grandchild. Conformity. He says, to hell with this conformity, I am going to find myself. So how do I find myself? For example, I have a pen right in front of me. I write it on the board. On the white marker, we've got a lot, lot of things that we do in our classes, no? a chalk piece we use. Or a computer that I have in, you know, in front of me. I type out a whole lot of things on the computer using my keyboard. I'm not conscious of my fingers that are doing the typing. I'm not conscious of the keyboard that is helping me in the typing. I'm not conscious of the computer that helps me in the typing. I'm just conscious of the words that I'm typing it out. Like this pen that I have in my hand, I'm conscious that I write something. I'm not conscious of this pen. Martin Heidegger says, just for a minute, if you can step aside and think differently, think differently because, you know, Ezra Pound also, the same century he says, no, make it new, think differently. If you can think about what you have in hand and how is it meaningful? Where does its meaning come from? When you think about it, like the cup of coffee that uh, you know, Husserl had in hand. When he starts to think about the cup of coffee in hand, he was doing what is called phenomenology. Experience as I experience it. The cup of coffee as I experience it. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's so tasty. You can't know because the experience that is human apartment under one narrow, narrow divisive walls. How can you do that? And this is what he says, you know, these you know what uh, uh, Tago would say, the narrow domestic walls of conformity, how it you know, deters us from realizing the full potential that is in us. When I step aside, I bracket it out. You know, Heidegger uses the word bracketing and look at the thing for its thingness. Eliot says, no, thisness of an object. When I look at a thing for its thingness, what do I get? When the computer you know, gets stuck when I'm working on it, suddenly, you know, God forbid, but when I'm working on the computer, it hangs or something gets you know, midway and the whole thing is erratic. For the first time, I stop working on the computer. For the first time, I stop working on the keyboard, I step aside and what do I do? I introspect. I look at what went wrong. This is an example, you know, that we have the stapler example that we give, you know, a stapler, if we use it for, you know, 
stapling papers together. But when you find that the staple pin has been inserted topsy-turvy and it doesn't work, that moment we take a look or I take a peek into the stapler and see why did it happen? Exactly what we are called to do in these troubling, in these testing times. When everything goes smooth, we are not worried about you know, whatever happens. The computer helps me, we don't bother about our fingers, we don't bother about the keyboard, the computer. The world is too much with us. That's what Wordsworth says. It's not in us. With us means I carry it. No, I carry it like a kerchief in my hand. I carry it. I can leave it away. But it is with us. Getting and spending, we lay, waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. Every day, get and spend. An inauthentic mode of existence. So when I step back, bracket out, when one fine day I come to know that the world around me has collapsed, how do I make meaning for myself in these troubling times? How do I make sense of myself in these troubling times? As I said earlier, I'm invoking, you know, uh, assuming a, a larger audience here. How do I invoke meaning for myself in these testing times? Socrates says, know thyself. Answer the voice of your conscience. Carl Jung says, who looks outside dreams, who looks inside awakens. Jiro Krishnamurti, one of my favorite academicians of all time. I made sure I took, I, I got uh, 100 copies of his book on education and I distributed it free of cost to all who asked for it in, as part of the Reader's Club. His views on education, stepping aside. What, Rabindran, what uh, Dr. Radha Krishnan would call this inward subjectivity. When you look outside, you just dream. You won't get answers. When you look inside, you get answers. Krishnamurti says, you need not run to you know, a, a library, to a book, anywhere to discover you. Because the whole treasury says is within you. But first, you create yourself and you always tell yourself that you are you know, a treasure in yourself. There is nobody on this planet to replicate you, to imitate you. You are so unique. You, don't, you are beyond any compartmentalized concepts or definitions because you know you are unique. And how can you know that you are unique? By the choices that you make in your life. A choice, he says, based on human dignity. This is very important. If conformity kills the human dignity in you, he says, step aside. How do we make meaning in these troubling times? How do I create meaning for myself in these troubling times? A whole lot of you know, great minds flash across my mind when I think about how they meaning, make meaning for themselves during these testing times, literature in times like these. Before I give you some real life examples, I'll tell you about Margaret Atwood in her wonderful little poem that she wrote, Journey to the Interior. She says, I want to take a journey within me because I feel you know, the journey outside is my is illusion. So she takes the journey within. She says, many have, you know, started on this introspective journey, but many have failed. But I think if you undertake this journey, this is the best journey that you can ever do. There is no destination apart from this, she says, Margaret Atwood. There are a lot of, you know, problems in this journey. You don't have maps in this journey. No one is there to guide you in this journey. There is no light in this journey. It might seem dark in this journey. 
That's why many try to escape from the journey within. Because they feel, you know, they, they want to live to the dictates of the pleasant life that is given to them, not the life of goodness or meaningfulness that is enshrined for authentic life. So this journey within, she says, makes her introspect, makes her confident of herself. And towards the end, she says, although she had a lot of distractions, a, pad, a, you know, a kitchen knife at home, it was a great distraction for her. Shoes at home, they were distractions for her. What will she cook? They were distractions for her. But she still, she said, I want to undertake this journey because only then I can know myself what Socrates said. And this journey, when she undertook towards the end, she says, there is no destination apart from this. History abounds with such examples of how single souls who have found meaning, jnanam, jnana for themselves, based on these searches, not willing to succumb to the charms of the wiles of conformity, to the stereotypes that have a grapple hold of them, but they want to step aside, think about themselves, and just go ahead. Last month, on May uh, 31st, our Prime Minister gave a wonderful example of a person Last month, even this month, a, a person from Madurai, you know, C. Mohan. I was so happy that, that he mentioned him right, from Madurai, who had, you know, he was a barber. He ran a saloon. He runs a saloon. Eight point five lakh rupees. He was able to give to one thousand five hundred families in these times of crisis. <laughs> An authentic life. Only daughter, thirteen-year-old Netra. She awoke to this realization when she saw the grim horrors facing her on television every day. Ah, can we do something about it? He said, "My only daughter." I have money for your future education. I have money for you. She said, why can't we give this money to feed the poor in these times of crisis? 1,500 families have benefited because of his larger sake. He was trying to lead an authentic life, a meaningful life, not the life of conformity, that tells me that I have to hold money by the number at the end of my you know, working period, after 25 years or 30 years, I should have a rich you know, uh, jewelry, money on me, a very rich man when I retire. A barber who has no other means of existence with a salon in him, he was able to spend all the resources at his command, 8.5 lakh rupees on what is called humanity. Stepping aside and thinking what matters most for life. We also have the example of the pond men that our prime minister mentioned last month. This pond man is a, you know, uh, in, in, in uh, Karnataka. He's called the water man. These examples, right, if you have a glimpse on your screen, you will see over a period of time, he has built more than 42 ponds. Over a period of time, he has built, you know, he has created. He stepped aside, thought, what matters to him? I'm not going to conform to the dictates of a society that is asking me to conform. My biology doesn't matter. My beauty doesn't matter. My physique doesn't matter. The clothes that I wear don't matter to me. What matters is how I make use of time in a very authentic mode of existence to the larger section of society. The next you know, uh, one is about the tree man. Right? Tree man also is very popular in Chitrakot in Uttar Pradesh. He went around you know, uh, planting a lot of trees you know, all over, all over the, that particular village. And today you will see 
it is a forest when you go up in the skies also in the airplane you will, you can see that's what they say right this beautiful forest beauty doesn't matter for a person who wants to live an authentic life personality doesn't matter money doesn't matter what matters is i am a work in progress the realization i create myself based on how i live an authentic mode of existence now i'll give you another example there are many examples in literature also professors of literature i was touched when i came to know about you know a professor of literature from madurai dr rajaram thousands of trees he has planted i was so touched a professor of english from madurai professor you know you, you see him on the screen dr m rajaram thousands of trees in the next slide you will see see how the place was previously you know a uh, 3 years back how it was filled with just red sand and how after a period of time after 3 years right, the whole place is vibing with life vibing with greenery a beautiful forest he took the initiative he said i will step aside i will bracket out my experience i will think about why i live in this life it is going to be a, a life of conformity or is it going to be a life that i make myself a work in progress he has created a wonderful paradise on earth by his single beautiful initiative that's what you see on the screen right in front of you another beautiful example that i i i like to tell you you know many examples are there but for lack of time i'm just winding it up two girls in the year 1993 vandana and the next one is vaishnavi 1993 you will see them here on screen when they were just college students in the final year they saw a mentally deranged woman roaming on the streets without a single cloth on her they were so touched they they felt right what is human life all about when a woman who is mentally deranged doesn't have cloths on her clothes on her she went to the principal's house took a sari clothed this woman and that night these two could not sleep they said they said how can we sleep when i see a woman without clothes mentally deranged on the streets that day they set about on this wonderful journey of exploration of the self and then today very close to my house every day when i go for my coffee or something right i see this huge building called banyan if you keen banyan.org on your website you will see it's 25 years since they started vandana and vaishnavi and today they are housing a whole lot of mentally deranged women now the service is extended to men also wherever they find them they house them an authentic mode of existence when i step out from my conformity and one reason why existentialism is a theory that is uh, that, that deals a death blow to most of the past philosophical insights of the past philosophers who deal with abstractions not the single person uh, you know being in the world experience when i realized that i have a beautiful life within me that is waiting to come out a work in progress when i have this awareness that conformity kills that stereotypes they they stifle you the moment i think that i come out of this existence this mundane monotonous existence and see how can i be of use to the wider society around me like in the truman show towards the end he does that i will end with a beautiful little story of one of my favorite actors right in this part of the world i i've always admired rajnikanth right most of us do as an actor he is phenomenal right from the uh, uh, 1980s right i have been watching his movies so uh, i'm not part of a fan club or whatever organization but i love him right <clears throat> his style his charisma 
but he you know he often used to go to the himalayas we all know that no i like it because i also go on these lo long solitary journeys very often go on sabbaticals i call it he goes on these himalayan sojourns very often and one day one of the you know press people asked him a question when he returned from his you know uh, pilgrimage to the himalayas when he returned they asked him a wonderful a question a very you know an ordinary question sir very often you go on these you know pilgrimages they asked him why do you go like that you know the answer he gave a very you know wise answer and uh, he you know uh, impacted me much because of that he said i don't know whether he read heidegger or not i don't know whether he must have read husserl or not but he spoke more than a heidegger when he gave this answer so you know what he said he called his name the video is still there on youtube you can watch it any time he called his name and he said a good question a very good question that you asked for life you know what he said every day of my life when i live in this world i feel it is a step it is a step towards i marching towards the only imminent reality ahead of me that is death the only reality i had every day of my life when i spot one gray hair on me many gray hairs on me over a period of time i am conscious of this fact that one day the real reality that is going to stare me right in the face is going to be death i want to live a life that is very conscious of this fact that i am marching every day towards this ultimate reality that is death i i want to live a meaningful life this is one step in that direction is there are many steps this is one step in the direction to know who i am and if we today can take a pledge that i will not be conformed to the cliched stereotypes all the biases the theories the assumptions the prejudices that have been stifling me that have been constraining and constricting me from all sides when i take a decision that i will live an authentic life our existence will really precede our essence and we will make meaning in our life in a very phenomenal way thank you so much sir i have a question yes uh so uh, earlier in this session you talked about phenomenology uh, something like that but uh, i actually have read about phenomenology and phenomenological criticism etc but uh, i didn't get that uh, concept uh, much okay you want Could to you know something elaborate? more about yes yes yes, yes. actually yeah uh, um you know uh, phenomenology is the realm of Uh, describing phenomena as simple as that phenomena lived experience right as simple as that when it comes to human nature you go into existentialism as simple as that right so lived experience the felt experience the lived reality right your own consciousness like like i told you know when you you know have a sip you know when you sip from your cup that experience is uniquely yours i'll just give you an example i love my country love is there i love my dog love is there i love my father love is there i love chocolates love is there i love my girl love is there i love literature love is there but the love there is stratified isn't it right and this is what we mean experience although it might be the same word the experience differs based on individuals and that is why phenomenology doesn't deal with abstractions it is it deals with real life experience as you see it bracketing out everything else in a, in other words right the, the concept of defamiliarization 
that uh, Victor yes, uh, uh, in Russian Shlokovsky, formalism, I guess. Russian formalism, exactly. You know, in 1917, in this wonderful essay, artist technique, he coined this term, no, defamiliarization. Looking yes. at it, yes, not from an habituated perspective, from a defamiliarized perspective, yes. I think he says that uh, literature is about defamiliarizing the concept and making it uh, new, even if the concept is already familiar to all of us. Yes, 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 making it new, like Ezra Pound says, yes. And why should you make it new? To come out with new layers of meaning, right? From your habituated, familiarized, you know, conception of something, when you step aside and have a look at it, you tend to look at it from something, a newer perspective, getting, uh, you know, uh, better ideas and meanings. Sir, excuse me. Yes. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are. With, with your permission and organizing committee, I would like to take permission to put a question before you. Yes, sir. Uh, shall I ask you, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can. Sir, I am Dr. Giri Prasad from Telangana State Kakati University. Okay. You spoke well of all the philosophical uh, uh, knowledge that touched the bones of me. Uh, it is good, but uh, as far as I am concerned, internal recurrence, those the philosophers who spoke and made the theories, and what is the exactly, uh, what is the point they reached? What is the point they reached and brought the solutions? That is the first question. And okay, another yes. one, I want to, I want to link okay. up uh, to another one that, uh, yeah, you have been talking about all the philosophers and uh, stepping, stepping to know the conundrums of the life, the most intricacies of the question, life intricacies questions. So what makes people happy reading all the philosophies? And uh, I think uh, we are uh, taking the energy when we read. Uh, these are all the things. And the internal recurrence, what is the final uh, destiny for that? Suppose to know the purpose of the life. Did they achieve the target to know the purpose of the life? Uh, Please, your comments. Very good, very good, sir. Very good question. A very meaningful, very sensible question. So, see, he says, he critiques. I uh, uh, hope I'm audible. Yes. So the concept of eternal recurrence, right? He doesn't advocate it. He says, you know, when you are aware, it's a time loop, he says, right? Like in the Truman Show or in, you know, uh, Wild Strawberries by Ingmar uh, Bergman, uh, that 1957 movie. When, when he steps outside of it, right, the eternal recurrence, when he thinks, this habituated existence is not for me. I should create meaning. You step aside. You bracket it out. And that's what he says. <clears throat> and uh, like you said, yeah, the second question that you said, you know, philosophers, how do they, you know, the whole, uh, you know, the gamut of reading that we do, how do they, you know, it is just making us aware of the immense possibilities. That is why some of the philosophies, 
you know deconstruction when it came in the 1960s we call it the theory of liberation right so these philosophies that come right they give us a better engagement not only with society but with ourselves with a sense of self hello yes. um uh, thank you dr rufus you took us really into a journey into the interior and appreciate um the scholastic uh, journey you have taken us through from the 19th century to the present day and to present reality we have got so a lot of appreciation in terms of feedback on our screens and uh, a couple of questions also but i don't think we have time for them and i'm thankful for the questions you've been able to answer uh, thank you very much sir and i thank all the participants for joining us today thank you we look forward to seeing you tomorrow thank you thank you so much